here. Welcome to our Tokyo FinTech Meetup. We haven't done one in a while, so it's good to be back here with an excellent panel and a fairly complex topic. And the reason we're here today is that the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, had put out an update of their guidance for the approach to virtual assets and virtual asset service providers out to public comment and the period for comment ended 20th of April or thereabouts. Um, there, there are some comments that have been made public by uh, groups like the Blockchain Association in Singapore, for example. And if you take a look at the draft, which is a meaty 99 pages, um, the date for publication was drafted in there is June. So the, the final version, taking all the comments into account, will be with us soon. In the interim, the FSA in Japan came out with a statement as well and saying that they have asked the JVCEA, the self-regulatory body, to basically define the, the rules to implement this by April 2020 in Japan, um, which by my count is less than a year away. So that's all very exciting. So what we're trying to do with, with our audience, we always have some extreme professionals who've been in the crypto space for a long time. We've got also lots of people who are come out of the compliance space. We do have some newbies who want to dip in and get the first feel. So we're trying tonight to bridge that a bit and give you a bit of the landscape what's going on in Japan with Kawai Sensei in ASEAN with Saga and then the experience especially from the implementation already of the travel rule in Switzerland with this Lucas. So um, if you have any questions please uh, do use the Q&A box. Um, there's also the chat box. Uh, if you just use Q&A you can remain anonymous and uh, we, we can sift through the, the question. Our objective is to use the first half as kind of opening statements of the follow the sun um, and then the second half will open up for Q&A. So there are questions that need to be answered immediately, I'll be interjecting, but otherwise we have about 10 minutes each with Kawai Sensei, Saga and then, then Lucas. So um, really pleased uh, and, and very happy that Ken took, could take the, the time here. Uh, we, we need to, to stress and congratulate him as the, the latest list of Japan's best lawyers has been out and uh, Ken was listed there for derivatives and fintech. So that's a, it's a double trophy, congratulations to that. And even more so happy to have you here and I'll hand it over to you straight away. Yeah, uh, thank you, Norbert, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, uh, before uh, entering in, dive into the FATF of matters, uh, I'd like to explain a little bit about Japanese regulations on cryptos, uh, because we have uh, today, tonight we have uh, non-Japan based uh, audience as well. Uh, back in 2017, uh, Japan uh, introduced uh, crypto regulations under the Payment Services Act. Uh, under the Payment Services Act, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or other uh, cryptocurrencies, mainly uh, payment tokens and UTT tokens, are regulated as uh, crypto assets in Japan. Uh, so, in most countries, uh, people are worried about whether the uh, budget currencies or crypto assets are categorized as securities. But in Japan, we need to think about uh, whether it is categorized as securities and whether it is categorized as or categorized as uh, crypto assets. So even in the case that uh, the token does not fall under the definition of crypt, uh, securities, uh, we need to think about whether it is categorized as uh, crypto assets or the uh, virtual currencies. Uh, 
so uh, if uh, so, the, those who would like to handle uh, crypto assets such as Bitcoin, Ether, uh, XRP, uh, or others, uh, then uh, you need to have undergo registration as a crypto uh, asset exchange service providers uh, in order to provide exchange service, custody service, uh, and uh, transfer services. So uh, this is the difference from uh, the rules, especially from the uh, US ones. And uh, uh, what is uh, unique in Japan is that we have uh, recognized uh, self-regulatory organization here in Japan, and all of the licensed entities are the members of that SRO. Uh, the name of the SRO is Japan uh, uh, Japan Virtual and Crypto Asset Exchange Association, in short, the JVCEA. So currently, we have around 25 uh, licensed entities, and all of them are the JVCA members. So uh, for instance, if uh, the exchange would like to list new tokens, then uh, they need to consult with the JVCEA. So uh, this is the uh, rules of that. And as for the FATF matters, uh, uh, the Japan uh, Japanese licensed entities uh, need to comply with the Japan AML CFT law. Uh, and uh, uh, they need to do the KYC and CDD when uh, onboarding clients or customers. So uh, of, we have not yet started uh, sending uh, messages uh, from uh, originating VASP to receiving VASP at the moment. But uh, 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 the, under the JVCA, we are discussing how to do that. Uh, uh, because uh, of course, uh, maybe we we may start uh, from ex uh, ex sending in these kind of clients information uh, within Japan because they are all licensed entities. Uh, but uh, we are we are still need to consider how to do that when transferring the uh, information to other countries, uh, because we need to think about uh, privacy and uh, uh, personal information protections on that. Uh, so uh, that would be a big challenge of that. And of course, uh, uh, as for the revised FATF, uh, a proposed a revised FATF uh, guidance, uh, the JVCEA and other uh, industry organizations such as JCBA, Japan uh, Crypto Asset Business Association, uh, uh, submitted uh, the public comments uh, to the FATF, uh, which uh, emphasize uh, that uh, the, uh, the proposed uh, guidance under the proposed guidance uh, the definition of virtual asset and virtual asset service providers uh, 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 seem to be more broad and uh, vague right now so uh, yeah uh, uh, I may I may have talked too much so yeah Let, let's move on to the next panel. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Ken. That was a good start. So uh, we're moving into Singapore and the ASEAN region with Saga, who's a director of regulatory compliance and financial crime at Chain Analysis, uh, which is a company um, in, the, in the early days, I think 2015 or so, I saw presentations from Jonathan in, in New York. So um, that was a time when we, we thought uh, crypto transactions are still anonymous and uh, what are they talking about tracing all of this? And a you know, few years later now, uh, nobody would use 
Bitcoin to hide any transactions anymore. So the, the landscape has changed substantially uh, thanks to companies like Chainalysis and, and others that we also had previously in our meetup. So I hand it over to you, Saga. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Norbert. And thanks for giving uh, me the opportunity to share my thoughts with this uh, great set of people today. Great. So let me start with uh, sharing a couple of slides with the people. Uh, so as you can see on my screen, uh, these are like some of the uh, agenda items for today, which we'll be going through. I'll be going through and walking through some of these developments that have taken place across the globe, whether it's related to banks, what is their exposure and how they should be aware of when it comes to dealing with cryptocurrencies or even if when they are planning to deal with cryptocurrencies, also some of the regional regulatory developments and what are the compliance strategies people should be aware of. And uh, yeah, other than that, if there are any Q&A, happy to answer after that. So this is a little bit uh, briefly about me. So I am, as uh, Nobert mentioned, a director of regulatory compliance at, and uh, law enforcement at Chainlysis. I have been with the company for uh, more than a year now and previous to Chainlysis, I was uh, heading the compliance for one of the Japanese uh, Japanese exchange uh, regulated and licensed in, uh, in Japan. And previous to uh, that exchange, I was with mainly with banks for 10 over years, and but mainly always with the, uh, the compliance regulations and AML stuff. So let's take a look at uh, cryptocurrency use worldwide in a very uh, general at very high level. So as you may see from this slide also, uh, there are like millions of people across the globe who have been using the cryptocurrencies for various purposes, like for example, uh, doing transactions, doing investments, or just simply storing value and waiting for its price to go up. And if we look at look back at the 2019 data itself, just for that one particular year, we observed that over one trillion of the cryptocurrency, uh, one trillion dollar worth of cryptocurrencies actually changed hands back in 2019. But it was uh, surprising to see to most of the people that. Uh, uh, like, like, because the common narrative about cryptocurrencies is that, that mainly the cryptocurrency is for criminals, it's used for money laundering, it is associated with illegal activities. But if we analyze the data, which, uh, which I just mentioned back in 2019, just 1.1% of the total one plus trillion dollars was associated with the criminal activity. So this is really worth taking note because, uh, because this is really a uh, derives the future of the cryptocurrencies that not anything and everything associated with cryptocurrency is illegal. And why we can say that this is because because of the transparent nature of blockchain. And this is not something any company has came up with because this is the, the data available on blockchain. So if that can be analyzed properly, this is the percentage which was associated with illegal activities. Quickly understanding the, uh, the exposure of banks for the cryptocurrencies. So as you can again see on my screen, there are two use cases that we have uh, uh, that, that simply summarizes the exposure of uh, banks to cryptocurrencies. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is a bank customer who is having an account with one of the financial institution or one of the major banks, let's say in the, across the globe, anywhere in the group. And then he or she transfers funds to his uh, VASP account, which is uh, nothing but exchange account. And from there, then that customer actually transfers to any of these illegal services, which can be terrorist financing, dark net market or sanctioned individuals. This, there are a couple of ways to analyze this part. One is he or she directly transfers to this, any of these uh, services, whether purposely or accidentally, because he might be asked to uh, transfer funds to these services, or he might be asked to transfer through one of his friends, his colleagues, but unaware of the fact that he's transferring to any of these illegal services. So these are like two ways where the funds are getting transferred to these illegal activities directly from an exchange. Secondly, there might be multiple layers uh, uh, available in between this VASP and this uh, illegal uh, organizations. So what it means is that from VASP, let's say this person transferred to one of the private wallets or one of the unidentified wallets, which is not associated with any of the exchanges. And, and after having such hops, eventually it reaches to one of these illegal services. In either way, the bank is getting exposed to this uh, to these uh, illegal services, which is something alarming for uh, for any regulators or even for FATF. They have been clearly telling the banks, for example, that you should be aware of your uh, exposure to these uh, currencies as well as what are they doing with these currencies. So, for example, in this case, associating it with any of these illegal services. On the other side, if you look at scenario two, which means a person who is having an account at a VASP or a cryptocurrency exchange, 
he is receiving that funds from these illegal activities, which is from uh, coming from an extortion or kidnapping scenario or uh, uh, accepting payment for ransom uh, for, for like deriving from the ransom, basically. So again, this can be directly received by this person or through various hops. And from there, he is then cashing out the funds from his bank account, which is uh, can be with any of the banks across the globe again. So what banks need to be aware of at this stage is that probably what they can uh, do is one is uh, identifying the source of funds where the customer is sending fund from. If let's say customer declare on its own, it's, uh, it's a return from a cryptocurrencies, then probably getting the wallet addresses of the customer and then uh, uh, deep diving into that wallet address, where is the funds coming from, whether it is associated with any of such activities or uh, any of these uh, activities, which is not uh, not allowed as per the bank's compliance program. So these are some of the ways that banks should be aware of. It, with that, they can keep their customers' involvement safe, even those who are not involved with cryptocurrencies. After that, it's important to understand what is the difference between transaction monitoring in fiat currency versus the cryptocurrencies. So as you, uh, as the people on the call might already be aware of that for fiat currency transaction, it's quite straightforward. So uh, bank A customer sends money to his friend or colleague or uh, another person at bank B. So bank A is only interested where the funds are going to. If they identify that the funds are going to another bank, they simply close, uh, they simply basically don't suspect it because it's going from one bank to another bank. Similarly, when bank B uh, uh, do a screening of the funds where it is coming from, they identify that it's coming from a bank. So the money received is totally clean and safe. But what happens after the bank B, then the funds are transferred outside or being withdrawn, nobody knows. So especially bank A loses its visibility what happens after bank B. So that's where the, limit, the limitations of fiat currency transactions are. Basically, you wouldn't know where eventually these funds have been used for, whether legally or to any or to support any illegal uh, activities or services. But coming to the cryptocurrency uh, workflow, basically because cryptocurrency and blockchain are transparent. So what happens here is a customer from his uh, VASP account transfer funds to let's say one of his uh, colleague or friends where to an unknown address, which is not attributed or not belonging to an exchange, for example, but eventually it reaches to one of the illicit entities, for example, a terrorist financing organization. So because of the transparency of blockchain, then you can see uh, whether the funds have been received uh, or being used to fund any of these illegal uh, services. And in that way, the alerts can be generated and accordingly the customers can be uh, dealt with. So at high level, basically summarizing the challenges for financial institutions as well as exchanges, basically, basically cryptocurrencies is still considered new. So there's lack of understanding and to some jurisdiction. Again, we are not focusing on any particular country, but I am talking from like the whole of the Asia or APEC perspective. So this is still considered new to most of the countries and they need to be aware of this kind of exposure that their customers are making them uh, exposed to. Second is incomplete view of exchanges. So this is critical because uh, as we all know, and as uh, in general terms, everyone says that blockchain are transparent, which is true, but the, the cryptocurrency services or block or the services on blockchain are not transparent. So that is important to understand. And then there should be ways or systems deployed in place in by any uh, compliance person of that institute to how to uh, get uh, more details about these exchanges or these services. Thirdly, the complex financial crime because the transactions are not straightforward, which I just explained in a previous uh, slide. So it's important to understand the overall structure, the overall flow of these transactions, and then uh, deep diving into who's the actual culprit of this uh, associated with this kind of transactions. Next is, let's quickly take a look at, uh, at the, the some of the developments that have taken place. So OFAC has started blacklisting cryptocurrency addresses. So with the instance of cryptocurrency involvement in like money laundering and increase in crypto crime activities recently, uh, basically uh, due to the certain reasons, like for example, increase in the Bitcoin price, OFAC has started blacklisting uh, cryptocurrency addresses associated with these activities, such as uh, some of the instances we put here, such as fraud, scam, darknet markets. So beginning from 2018 until this year, basically, there have been a total of 200 plus addresses where, uh, which have been blacklisted by OFAC. The blacklisting is uh, not only a term by OFAC, but it's also bringing such addresses into mainstream of uh, transaction monitoring or transaction screening, which was previously hidden and uh, were highlighted if associated with any of such transactions. So it is important to take note of these developments that are taking place. 
Similarly, fight have red flags, which was introduced back in September 2020, where uh, there were like two of the mainly identified uh, uh, red flags, which were identified viable, uh, identifiable via blockchain analysis, the other one which are non identifiable via Block, uh, via blockchain. So basically, in general, I would explain that uh, the transactions happening off on blockchain, there are red flags associated with it, but the ones which are taking outside blockchain basically would not be highlighted under these red flags. Quickly taking a look at the regulatory developments in the region. So Singapore, as uh, most of the people might already be aware of that back in 2019, the, the PSA Payment Services Act was introduced. And since then, uh, Singapore has basically been inviting applications to uh, license these exchanges, which is still in progress and uh, exchanges are expected to receive their licenses anytime soon. Similarly, for Japan, Japan was one of the first countries who declared uh, Bitcoin as a legal currency back in April 2017. And then, uh, if I'm not wrong, that's where the first license also they started giving issuing to the eligible exchanges. Uh, also, quick look at one of some of the developments in the neighboring country, which is in India. So uh, similarly, uh, back in uh, 2018, RBI, the Reserve Bank of India or Central Bank of India, uh, banks uh, basically bans the banks from dealing with cryptocurrency uh, uh, any, in any form. And then there was a draft bill introduced back in September 2019 to ban the cryptocurrencies in the region. And in March 2020, the Supreme Court basically overturned the central bank's uh, two-year-old ban on cryptocurrencies. So as such, it is still in the midst of deciding whether they should continue with the cryptocurrencies or not. The last part is impact on of regulations and the next steps. So for exchanges and VAS, basically uh, the impact is they need to register and get themselves licensed subject to AML and CFT uh, requirements at the time of onboarding as well as uh, the periodic reviews. Transaction monitoring need to be uh, structured and in place. And at the same time, SAR, STR to be raised for any suspicious activity. Uh, similarly, for financial uh, institutes or banks, basically exchanges are required to be monitored to be KYC before start dealing with them. They should have a strong compliance framework in place and also the risk or the risk rating of these exchanges are important. For regulators point of view, there should be additional uh, licenses, they should have additional resources in place who understand this industry well and eventually start giving them licenses. Also, they need to monitor this SAR, STR submitted by exchanges. Uh, so these are some of the things which these particular verticals should be aware of and uh, and also for our people to get their understanding clear in this uh, in this aspect right so with that that is like end of my part and i i think i've taken slightly longer than the time allocated to me and i hand over back to nobert thank you sir just about right thank you so moving on to switzerland so we, we welcome lucas who's the, the, Bitcoin, the president of the Bitcoin Association in Switzerland and also the founder and chief ex executive officers of 21 Analytics, which is a company that provides services specifically around the travel rule. And he's actually got the hands-on experience with what happens when you're one of the first countries to implement it. And so we're very curious to leave the realm of the theory and hear what really happens on the ground with the different players in the ecosystem. Over to you, Lucas. Thank you, Norbert. Let me quickly share my slides too. Okay. So I'm going to specifically talk about the travel rule. And as you mentioned, um, the travel rule is already in place in Switzerland since quite some time. So I'm also going to talk about what were the effects of the travel rule. And I would consider them a bit different than the regulator might have intended to, at least for now. So first of all, I just want to talk quickly about how Bitcoin works when you transfer from a WASP, which is a virtual asset service provider, to a different word for an exchange, bank, or broker. Um, it's transacting to another WASP, so meaning from one place you're withdrawing to the other place you're depositing Bitcoin. And then on the, from one WASP doesn't know who is transacting to, to the other WASP. So in the middle there's like the black box is the Bitcoin network. Using chain analysis they can tell, okay, these coins are now coming from WASP A, WASP B can see that, and WASP A will later on know that this is going to WASP B, but they're not exchanging the information about who particularly is sending to whom. 
like in the banking world, when you do a, at least in, in Europe, you do a SEPA transaction, you have to add your name and address so both banks know who is sending to who. So this is not part of a traditional transaction when you're sending from one WASP to another WASP. Now, the next case, which is um, a bit more unique to the crypto case, is when you withdraw from a WASP, from an exchange, to your own non-custodial wallet, meaning a wallet where you own the private keys. It's often also called now from the FATF, they call it the unhosted wallet or um, also a private wallet. So there again, the WASP does not particularly know that he is sending to a non-custodial wallet. He can assume so based on the result from chain analysis, but he cannot be 100% certain until later in time. So the Bitcoin blockchain is always some kind of black box. And then the third case is when you deposit Bitcoin from your non-custodial wallet again to a WASP. Um, all in these cases they have in common that doesn't matter which transaction they do, one WASP does not know if, if it's transaction with a counterparty WASP. Sometimes they know immediately, sometimes they don't, depending on the, the chain analysis or whatever provider you're using, but they for sure don't know like who is the recipient and the sender of that transaction. And this is what the travel rule actually is all about. They just want to have the same in crypto as we have in fiat right now, meaning when you're sending from WASP A to WASP B, both WASP have to know who is sending to whom, so you can do all the uh, traditional AML checks that you do on the fiat side, also on the crypto side. Now, what is, um, so this is the, that case that I just described with the travel rule information, then going from A to B. Now, the challenge here is, um, you actually have to know who you're interacting with. If you're not, if you're sending to another WASP, you have to exchange the travel rule information. But if you're sending to a non-custodial wallet, being a wallet that is either owned by the customer itself or actually somebody else's wallet, then you 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 can't and you're not supposed to um, exchange travel rule information. So. Um, and the problem with this is if you, as a WASP in Switzerland right now, have to exchange um, with uh, Binance, because you know on the other side, even if you know on the other side there's Binance sitting, because Chainalysis told you there's Binance on the other side, this address, you cannot actually in an automated way do a travel rule information exchange because Binance or any other big WASP, they do not have a travel rule um, protocol solution in place. That's one problem. And the other problem is, of course, um, there are more than 1,200 WASPs all around the world. And now, in the perfect world, they would all agree and say, OK, of course, this information is not on the Bitcoin protocol or on any other um, virtual asset, crypto asset. It's not part of the blockchain itself. So we have to exchange them on another layer and everybody's going to agree, okay, we have to exchange it in this way, in this technical standard. Now, as always with standards, they need some time to evolve. Um, there's no currently one standard, but there's several competing open standards on how to exchange this information. Maybe a fear of some is in Switzerland, OpenWASP is fairly prominent. Then there's TRP, which is a travel rule protocol. There is a TRISA uh, in the US. There's also the Travel Rule Working Group in the US or US Travel Rule Working Group. There's a shift and there's a diff different different player. And of course, as a WASP, if you have to implement all of them and you need to know what protocol is your counterpart is speaking, it's getting quite complicated. And this is also what we uh, learned actually from Switzerland now, as I said, since 2019 already, um, for the banks that are directly FINMA regulated and dealing with crypto assets, uh, the travel rule is already in place. Now we also, like Japan, have self-regulated organizations and in Switzerland, need all the smaller WASP or nearly all of them are part of VAUCOF and VAUCOF um, as a self-regulated organization has the travel rule in place since January this year. But so in theory, all of them like could exchange or would have to exchange travel rule information between each other. But the problem is 90% of the traffic from a Swiss bus does not go to another Swiss bus, but goes to one of the big exchanges. And if your exchange does not implement the travel rule, you cannot actually do it on your side either. So this resulted in 
all the WASPs, more or less deactivating WASPs to WASP transfers. So the only thing you can do if, if you're a customer at a Swiss WASP, you can only withdraw to your own non-custodial wallet. You cannot send from a Swiss WASP to a Bitfinex or a Binance directly anymore. And uh, to make sure that you are actually only withdrawing to your own non-custodial wallet, the regulator asks the WASPs to ask their customer again to provide proof that they actually control this address. Uh, this is what we call the address ownership proof. Um, so, and how do you ask for this proof? Well, you have to, there are three ways that currently are, are um, approved by the FINMA. One is you ask the user to take a screenshot of your wallet. I mean, this is not very secure, obviously it doesn't scale, it's, it's very manual. Um, the other one is you do an, an on-chain transaction. You have to do like a ping pong between your and the WASP wallets. <clears throat> it's also rather a hustle. Uh, it costs, of course, again, transaction fees and so on. It doesn't really scale well. And the third approach is using digital signatures, which is by far the best way from a technical perspective, but also a bit more challenging since most wallets don't support it out of the box. But yeah, um, these are the learnings from Switzerland that we see now. We are one of the first that implemented the travel rule and it gave us as a country a clear disadvantage over other WASPs. For example, there are now WASPs that coming from Austria doing, wanted to get into a Swiss market, uh, doing a lot of art advertising in Switzerland, they don't have to follow the travel rule. So they don't have this restriction that you see here that you're not allowed to send from them to another WASP anymore. So it's, it's kind of, of course, we are ahead with regulation, which makes FATF happy. We maybe have also less cases when it comes to uh, money laundering and so on using crypto assets, but the unintentional side effect is that we have um, um, disadvantage over other jurisdiction. And I'm very curious how this will um, happen in Japan, since from, from my understanding, Japan is now also one of the first countries that implemented the travel rule. And I guess this number that we have here, that 90% of the, of the transactions are going to international WASPs, might also be true for uh, Japan. Um, yeah, that's it. Maybe you can give us some more insights on regarding the transactions between WASPs in Japan, how, how it's there. Or maybe Sagar has some data from chain analysis that would be interesting to hear. Thanks. Thank you, Lucas. You know, maybe I can comment on the on uh, the Japanese situation on the uh, travel compliance. So currently, uh, the JVCA the SRO uh, is going to implement that uh, every bus needs to uh, obtain the information uh, from the sending uh, uh, senders. Uh, to the uh, receiving entities information. But uh, uh, so let's say if they find, uh, but, uh, uh, but currently uh, the JVC rules does not uh, prohibit sending the VASP to uh, transfer uh, the cryptos to, let's say, the Binance or other uh, uh, unregulated uh, BASPs right now. So um, maybe uh, we are in the middle of implementing the travel law. So currently, we uh, the, all the BASPs in Japan need to get the information of the receiver uh, from the sender, uh, but uh, uh, there's no uh, ban or prohibition on that currently. So this is a situation right now, but uh, we need to think about the next step. And continuing from, from there, just more broadly, maybe, I think one of the criticisms of the draft also was around the definition of what a virtual asset service provider is and the, the service providers for the vast, which might include technology companies, which might include software developers, and it wasn't quite clear where that boundary is drawn. So 
uh, in the extreme case, if I'm a software developer, I create a DeFi application, right? By the nature of writing the software, will I be classified as a VAS already? So uh, the uh, FATF uh, proposed a new FATF uh, guidance uh, does not clear on the scope of the A and VASP. So previously, uh, we under the 2019 guidance, uh, we think that uh, the exchanges and the uh, hosted wallet service providers are the VASP. But uh, uh, as Norbert says, uh, currently it is not clear whether the software developer or the DeFi, I'm not sure whether there's a DeFi operator or so, but uh, I should say DeFi operator uh, would be categorized as VASP or not. But uh, 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 from the, uh, what FATF guy says is that, uh, if I understand correctly, that they, they say that they are not extending or the broadening the definition of these. It's a kind of elaboration of the 2019 role. Uh, but uh, uh, the industry does not think so. And uh, uh, maybe uh, at some stage, uh, the pure software developer uh, would not be categorized as bus, but those who are providing service by using uh, the software it may be categorized as VASP, even if uh, they say that we are providing the DeFi uh, service. And this is what I feel uh, from uh, the uh, uh, from uh, reading the latest uh, proposed guidance. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, what other panelists would think of on that. Definitely. Let me uh, add on. So to my understand what my understanding is on this, uh, on this part is basically, yes, you are right. It's not very clearly mentioned there, like what kind of services fall under that uh, category now, but at the same time, it's also dependent on a lot of uh, uh, like the key factor is mainly by like the local regulators. So FATF, as we all know, is like a, it's like a body, which governs, which guides these different countries in terms of uh, uh, what are the regulation they should be opting for, but they never like dictate or never made it mandatory. To, to implement as we always know it's, it's recommendations right so coming back to that so for example ms may have like an uh, stricter approach they might want to include such categories as uh, under vasp and they eventually want them to be licensed under psa so similarly for japan they can opt for either similar standards or probably a stricter uh, uh, regulations or the stricter approach for how they read the FATF guidance. So, so that I think plays an important role. So uh, uh, that's what like, for example, when under PSA, a lot of people were applying license in Singapore. So there were like a different set of requirements as not what mentioned by, for example, uh, uh, FATF requirements, but that were like mentioned by uh, MAS. So, so like, yeah, just for instance, when it comes to transaction monitoring, you might need to take like, like, like last five or last 10 years of the transactions for a particular customer, whereas FATF might have only said two years or three years, just for example. So these kind of things really plays important role in identifying uh, what your local regulator is looking for. Yeah. Lucas, let me come back to kind of the, the, the tiering of kind of the regulated, unregulated. So given that you in Japan, we in Japan have a self-regulatory organization. You in Switzerland have one. So there, there is kind of this licensing mechanism built in. So if you get a mutual recognition across these jurisdictions, uh, it, it should be relatively easy to, it's almost like we're in the middle of the pandemic and we get the flight corridor right between Singapore and Hong Kong and, and everybody is kind of happy along these two destinations, implementing that across like two countries that have these licensing regimes and uh, have a reciprocal uh, recognition, it, that should maybe be the easier part, but then does that create a tier where kind of the money just circulates in, in that tier and never leaves it basically, or it, it couldn't leave it, if it leaves and it's tainted and it's hard to come back into the top tier of these organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, that would be a great starting point if we, uh, for, first of all, could agree in Switzerland on a technical standard. Then we could agree on Japan on a technical standard. And then we exchange at least between Switzerland and Japan and have a showcase that, look, this, this way it works. But this is already very difficult for the industry to do, as we see, just from a technical perspective. And then, of course, I assume there are also slight regulatory differences between Japan and Switzerland and how to interpret the FATF. So, um, yeah, I think, and also, since Mount Gox is not around anymore, I don't think there is much traffic going from Switzerland to Japanese exchanges. Uh, I have to admit, I, I never used the Japanese WASP since, since Mount Cox, which probably doesn't really count since it was before regulation, actually. So um, I think the traffic would be very minimal. If I say 90% of the traffic from Switzerland is going to the big ones, then um, it, it's probably like less than 1% are going to Japan, and I'm sure the other way around is the same. So it would be nice to have a showcase, but it's not very relevant to, to real life adoption. Um, I mean, I don't know if it, if it takes us a, a bit down a, a di different rabbit hole, but because the big ones uh, like Binance, of course, comes up, they, they list a, a large number of coins. And so in Japan, we not only have a regulatory regime around the virtual asset service providers, but we also have a wide listing of the coins. So there's there's only there's about 30 or so on, on the list. Similar number is the exchanges, actually. Um, so, in in a way, there there is a debate now between BAF and the German regulator and Binance around the securitized shares, right, of of Tesla, etc. And um, uh, do we ultimately need to resolve this that you can't do business with residents of a certain jurisdiction if you? not complying with the with the rules so you don't have a footprint in that country or you, you you not have a license in any any way is that maybe at the heart of the problem well uh, it might end up like this since i think it's similar like uh, in the traditional finance right it, it is kind of like that i mean depending on the country you're in so maybe it will be like this in a few years in crypto too yeah, I mean, I think the traditional finance is, is, is a question of solicitation and also the Japanese regulator has been, I think, relatively strict. If you put up a Japanese website that uh, solicits Japanese customers to go offshore, then they, the regulator here doesn't like it that much. And it's kind of a similar case in Germany of a German uh, Binance web page. Um, uh, yeah, it takes us down a different rabbit hole. But let's, let me get to, to, to an audience question here. And I think it's a valid one. And I mean, ultimately, it's at the at the core of what we're talking about. How do you ensure that these regulations, travel rule, and whatever the Fed F is doing, don't jeopardize the advantages of why clients find crypto attractive, especially when you begin to restrict transfers from one bus to another? So, uh, of course, there are different motivations of using crypto. Uh, clearly, um, so. Are we, are, we, are we destroying a market, basically? Um, actually, there's now the question, is it so bad if the user cannot send any more from one WASP to another WASP easily, but has to have his own wallet and has to hold his own private keys? I think that's good for the people because then and they actually educate themselves and they need to learn how to be their own bank. So maybe the regulator is helping us in that case, at least in short term. Yeah, if, I, if I if I can add on, uh, sorry, Lucas. Uh, yeah, so so to that point, uh, a lot of times compliance has been taken or regulations have been taken as uh, something not good for business. That that's like the general understanding about compliance or regulation. But I just want to add to that part, like especially on this question, like uh, like uh, the, these regulations don't jeopardize the advantages of why. So if somebody is doing it for legal purposes, if somebody is not doing for illegal purposes, there's nothing to worry about whether you are compliant or not compliant. There is something like a inner self you are aware of, I'm not funding any of this terrorist financing organization or I'm 
not funding this uh, exchange, which is which is like exposed to or mainly sending the transfers to any of these uh, uh, sanctioned countries or any of these terrorist financing sanctioned organization. In that case, there isn't much impact of compliance, I would say, because you are already doing that. So, so that so so if if and and of course if you are exposing yourself or if you are indirectly involved with these organizations uh, unknowingly or knowingly then of course then you might need to be extra careful basically then uh, the time has come to end these kind of transactions yep i so currently in maybe a uh, uh the va is getting popular and popular that's why uh, the regulations uh be and uh, is be, be uh become necessary yeah, but uh but currently uh some countries would like to follow the vata flu uh and some uh, countries uh would be slow to do that especially from the uh maybe the uh tax agent reasons or something like that. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, lots of uh, regulatory arbitrage would occur. And that could harm uh, the business development in the, uh, maybe the G7 countries, I would say. Uh, that could be a problematic. Uh, uh, that's what we need to think about. There was some different question that really gets me back on track here. Can the, the, the April 2020 deadline that the FSA set, is, do you think that is realistic? Is that realistic for defining the rules or is it, does it also include like timeline for implementation? It seems pretty tight. Yeah. It's pretty tight, and uh, actually, the but uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, FATA rules, even if it's implemented, uh, each country needs to uh, introduce it into their own systems, right? So, and it takes time, and uh, people understand that. So, uh, Anyhow, the FATF would announce uh, the final wall in June, I think, uh, the next uh, plenary. But of course, uh, then after that, uh, each country needs to think about how to uh, bring it into their own countries. So uh, it may take time, uh, maybe a couple of years long, I would say, yeah, and uh, yeah. Lucas, but does it leave you if it, if it takes like a few years for all the other countries to catch up with Switzerland? Uh, you've got the Austrians standing at the at the border and, and waving a vast free passport. Uh, where does it leave the Swiss crypto industry? Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to, I think, balance out our disadvantage with better technology for now. And I'm sure like the FMA in Austria will, will catch up and late, sooner or later they will have to implement the same regulations, especially, I mean, if they're Western European or Japanese, like, or to say countries with, um, with uh, like working regulator or not so, I mean, as you know, the other, the, some of the very big wasps are just all over the world and they're everywhere and nowhere. So they're very difficult to get a, get a hold on. So they will for sure be the last ones to implement it. But I mean, it has also its advantages if you um, do business with a, with a local wasp, um, especially when you have to deal with your tax offices again later. So this user, user experience disadvantage that we have coming from this new regulation, we have to balance out as good as possible on the technology level and then uh, make it clear to our market or the Swiss market here in Switzerland or the Japanese market in Japan that for, for other reasons, you, it makes more sense to just deal with, with, uh, with the wasps that you already know, that you already with, but yeah. 
Yeah, so it comes back also to what Sagar said earlier. So as, as long as you're you have ledger transactions, right, for investment purposes or with the defined business purpose that you can explain, as you say, you're better off doing it within your jurisdiction, assuming that. Uh, it's not only the transaction aspect, it's the taxation aspect afterwards, and, and that's all much easier done um, for friends who, who like doing taxes across Japan and the US. It has been always terrible to start with, and it hasn't become any easier with different views on how cryptocurrencies should be taxed. So there's a, there's a real hard practical implication. Um, when coming, I'm also back to the tying tying an individual to addresses. Is is that ultimately a trend that that we would see that in the same way you have a bank account, you have actually somewhere that might well be the tax office or the regulatory agency uh, a set of crypto addresses that that are registered and that are identified as yours. So this is what is happening in, in, in Switzerland if you have to do the proof that you own this, this non-custodial address. Um, and if you, of course, if you do a screenshot or if you do a, a sending from a specific address, then you're probably going to reuse that address over and over again. So you don't have to do these manual processes all the time. But uh, what we are working on now is automating this exchange of the, this registration of the address so that you can use a new address every time. And of course, your WASP then knows this is your address, um, but nobody else other than your WASP knows that because you don't not, not be using that address. So it reduces your privacy towards that WASP, but not really in a very meaningful way, I would say. So, because he already knew that you are somehow associated to that address, either being your address or somebody else's address that you have been doing business with. So it reduces privacy for sure a bit, Mm, but on the other side, it also re reduce, uh, increases security a bit because you have more certainty that this is actually the address that the customer wants to withdraw his funds to. And that it's not like a hacker sitting in between doing a man in the middle attack. So it has, it has some trade-offs. So Han was just saying that the same is actually a requirement in, in the Netherlands and there's discussion in Germany as well. So at least Central Europe seems to be moving in that direction. Uh, let's see, was there anything else? Uh, well, maybe we can take the first question. Uh, I like that with the OFAC compliant blocks that we see now just on, on Twitter recently, somebody pointed out that now this this new mining pool in the US that only takes transactions that are legit in their view. In my opinion, they will just be out competed by the market because if you as a miner um, sit just taking every transactions, then you have more transactions with more potential higher fees. So over the long run, if they're not somehow cross-financed, cross-financing this mining, they will lose against the other mining pools. So it's not really a danger to, to Bitcoin in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, no, but I think there is a question for me regarding uh, blacklisting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I think I can take that. So uh, the question, as we know, is uh, about the blacklisting of uh, of the certain addresses, for example, and how effective it is when private addresses can be created within seconds with no cost and restrictions. So I think uh, uh, going back to a, st a step back, basic taking a step back, basically, uh, address can be created within a like like couple of seconds of in millisecond. That is perfectly uh, fine. That's what is happening all across the globe as well. But the important thing here is to uh, note that uh, unless until a transaction has been made through an address, it's basically as clean as always, unless it is claimed by someone that this particular wallet address belongs to me. So for example, uh, I couldn't recall the name of the country, but I think early this year there was a uh, there was an instance where uh, one of the terrorist financing organizations, I think it was India or Indonesia somewhere, claiming that uh, uh, to uh, giving a threat to one of the industrialist, millionaire industries in uh, these countries, asking to transfer funds to this address. 
uh, which which this basically this address was given to uh, by law enforcement agencies to uh, some of the people to investigate and then eventually uh, because there wasn't any transaction happened so the only source of confirmation was that that post basically claiming that this address belongs to this terrorist financing organizations and nothing there so since then like for example we have been tracking those addresses unless until there is a transaction made if the balance remains zero nobody sending in nobody sending out so that remains uh, not an issue but once the transaction has been made and uh, there are certain limitations that uh, uh, you cannot stop any deposits made to your address but the withdrawals that definitely you can screen and stop these transaction so in that way blacklisting will help because one is it's claimed by terrorist financing organization and secondly you can block going forward any transactions which can be used for uh, further uh, like destructing purposes or something okay thank you um can let me let me ask a high level question just to, to round it out um in a, in a way, um, like from an implementation perspective, we said this all takes quite a while to do and um, many countries have not taken action and implemented regulation around what has been put out in 2019. And you alluded a bit also to the, the difference in perspective as to what these revised guidance now means uh, from the private sector, the, the feeling seems to be that is an expansion of the the scope while FATF says maybe well we're just trying to be more precise but we're not actually changing anything and so there's these two things is one saying well it's already 21 we haven't implemented any anything broadly globally over the last two years and then the view of uh, are we being asked to do no, now more and maybe even more maybe than the feared side? What is kind of the sense you get from all the industry players you're talking to around that kind of conflict? Can do you have a view on like your, your discussions from with, with industry players? Yeah, actually, the what so the uh, so uh, regulated was in Japan. Uh, uh, I talked uh, several of them about a lot of uh, new guidelines, uh, guidance, and uh, uh, what they think is that it's too early to expand the definition um, on that because uh, not many countries have implemented 2019 guidance yet. So the problems occurs not uh, from the regulated bus, but from the unlike the regulated busps right now. So what uh, the industry needs to do first is to implement 2019 rules, uh, not uh, go further beyond <laughs> at this moment. And uh, also I talked with some of the uh, service providers. Uh, they are actually worried about uh, if, when, they would be regulated whether uh, they provide solutions to the market directly, not through the uh, exchanges, but directly to the market. Uh, for instance, uh, those who are providing uh, uh, services, uh, uh, payment services or something like that, uh, so, but uh, uh, these people may worry too much about on the further flows because uh, anyhow, it will, uh, the Japanese government, if the J Japanese, uh, they only be maybe regulated if uh, Japanese government would like to expand their definition of crypto other service providers definitions. So 
maybe uh, the worries about worries from the software providers are maybe uh, to they 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 are worrying too they are worrying too much on that. Uh, this is what I think. Got it. Thank you. So I think we are we're right on the hour. We, we said we would start on time and we'll finish on time, um, given that we've taken precious time from our panelists. This is obviously a very complex topic, as we said. The, the draft is about 99 pages. Um, the final version will be out around June. So if you really like to dive into that, um, then <laughs> Take a take a good cup of coffee and and some cookies and and run run through it. It's also very interesting, um, but that's only the rules and the implementation. The devil is in the in the detail, and it starts as Lucas said with with just agreeing the the protocol, the communication, the data structure around this, which is very very difficult. And we have not touched on. Uh, other questions that have been raised, obviously the industry is developing further with stable coins, with stable coins that represent uh, a single underlying currency or maybe a multi-currency or regional stable coin, ultimately a global stable coin, how does that fit in there? And with the recent hype around NFTs, right, if you can't use uh, cryptocurrencies to transfer wealth can you use the nft and uh, clearly that as a uh, comes back also to the definition of a virtual asset in in the paper and it's uh, the fedf has been asked specifically whether the way they've written it now are nfts included or not so hopefully the final version will have some answers to that as well uh, this is clearly a topic that will stay with us for uh, a few years to come. So um, the, the three panelists are gainfully employed um, and uh, will have lots of fun with their teams uh, working on the on the implementation. So maybe a year from now when we, we know what happened in Japan, we'll have a good uh, checkpoint uh, once more to discuss and see what happened. In the interim, I think you will see more of Ken and Lucas and Saga in their respective capacities. And if you have specific questions, they are obviously open for business as well. So feel free to reach out. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, appreciate you taking the time and your input on this difficult topic. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Nobart. Yeah. Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.